titled The Art of Physic will replace the one shown in your broadcast calendar for transmission on the 23rd and 27th of March. Our next programme is for the second level course, Computing and Computers. It's the first programme in the course and it shows the way that two different companies use computers. In this first program, we're looking at two stories of computing in commerce. Naturally, we've picked two companies which are very unlike. Akai UK is a new subsidiary of the main Japanese company. It's been in existence about two years, and it uses computers in what's now become the conventional way. In contrast, Sainsbury's is old established, large, and it's been using computers for more than 20 years. We'll start with Akai. They import all kinds of hi-fi equipment. Open reel recorders, loudspeakers, cassette systems. They also deal in video recorders. Hey man, the music's gonna turn around. You turn it. But how do they use computers? When Akai started, they took over an existing agency and had therefore to set up their organization immediately. The situation was urgent. Managing Director, Gordon Proven, we started the business in February 79 with a few temporary staff and some temporary offices in North London. We felt that we would have to computerize very quickly if we were to catch up with the main competitors in our market who'd already been going for two years, in some cases far more than two years. And therefore we did everything in the initial stages with the thought in mind that we would have to computerize if we were to provide the sort of service our customers needed uh, and in fact to better the service of our competitors. How does the computer help Akai to run its business? This unit has code number PRO601. It's a combined tuner and cassette recorder with an automatic timer. If a hi-fi shop wants to buy some of these, they'll phone their order to Akai. Good afternoon, Akai Sales. Sorry, Albany Hi-Fi. Pro 601, yes, hold the line please, I'll check for you. Before Akai accept the order, they need to know whether the unit's in stock in the warehouse. That's where the computer comes in. There are four video terminals linked to the computer. The sales assistant is using this one to check on stock levels. The number she's typing at the bottom of the screen identifies the item she's asking about, the PRO601. And stored inside the computer is information about the number of those items in stock. Hello? Yes, we do have some in stock. How many did you want? Five. No, they're 456.45. Could you just hold the line while I check your credit, please? Thank you. The computer can also deal with credit inquiries. That's option three on the list. This time, the computer's been programmed to display a summary of previous orders from that customer and also an indication of whether the credit limit has been reached. Once again, that's information stored inside the computer. Yes, your credit's OK. They should be with you in about five days. OK, thank you. Bye-bye. 
Answering that inquiry took just a few seconds. That means that Akai can accept the order straight away. And in just a few days, five of those hi-fi units will be on their way to the dealer. So computers certainly seem to help Akai. But how exactly did they get started? Gordon Proven. We didn't have any in-house computer expertise, certainly in depth. One or two people had some cursory knowledge, but not much more. So we felt we had to call in a consultant who would advise us on a system that would satisfy our immediate requirements and, naturally enough, our forward requirements. The brief was that it should be simple, obviously cost-effective, and flexible enough to add on more sophisticated programs in the future. And, of course, we wanted it yesterday. So with that brief, the consultants went away and came back and presented their findings to us, and we gave them the go-ahead in December 1979. The consultants had already developed a system using a small computer like this for a similar job. So when Akai came to them, their first thought was to use that system again, though, of course, there would have to be some amendments. Consultant, John Maskell. Right, the next stage of the operation was to prepare a detailed business system specification in which all Akai's requirements for a computer system and the manual procedures that associated, were associated with it would be fully defined and specified. Once we'd done that, we were able to compare Akai's requirements with the facilities that were offered by the already existing system, which we implemented previously. As we'd anticipated, we found that, in fact, the degree of similarity was quite high and that we could make use of that system. There was one area in particular which was inappropriate and we would have to rewrite the programs for that area. We set about writing the programs and uh, the machine was installed. We trained Akai's staff so that they were able to test the programs themselves and only when both we and they were satisfied that the system was operating satisfactorily did we cut over to a full computerized operation. We would certainly not have been able to expand at the rate we have done without a computer system because the manual systems would not have coped with the rate of increase of the business. We have in fact increased by about three times since we started and that's without any overhead increase at all. Our credit control has also been simplified and which consequently has improved our cash flow greatly. Again, I don't think we would have managed this without a computer system. Our staff have coped extremely well because they've not suffered from the usual fear of computers or computeritis because we brought them into discussions at a very early stage. So all in all, we're pretty happy with the computer here at Akai UK. Akai's data processing requirements are typical of many companies, but the urgency of their problems was exceptional. Their story shows that computerization can be carried out swiftly and smoothly if you go about it in the right way. Well, now we go to Sainsbury's, where the computer's been used more and more since the very beginnings of the commercial data processing. And actually, Sainsbury's use computers in the same ways as Akai, but they've also developed some unusual operations needed because selling food is essentially a day-to-day -day operation. So how does the computer help to get the food into the shopper's basket? Sainsbury's have over 200 supermarkets. The one in this shopping precinct at Broadfields in Sussex was opened at the end of 1976. It's one of their largest supermarkets and it stocks the full range of grocery products, fresh food, fruit and vegetables, frozen foods and drinks. Keeping shops like this in stock needs a sizable computer. 
At Sainsbury's head office in London, this computer works night and day looking after the distribution of food. It's large because it has to do a big job. Sainsbury's have been using computers since the early days of data processing. Information Processing Manager, Peter Smith. Computers were introduced into Sainsbury's in 1961 after three years of intensive planning and preparation. From day one, they were used for the movement of goods uh, and not as sophisticated accounting machines, which were perhaps was more the norm at the time. Uh, today, we service some 200 plus supermarkets through 20 depots with a turnover of 1.8 five billion pounds. Uh, today the computer system covers all aspects of the company business uh, but we still consider the distribution systems both for the branches and the depots uh, to be our bread and butter and our main efforts are to concentrate on the evaluation of uh, new technology and facilities so that we continue to match the needs of the company. So Sainsbury's believe that computers are essential for organizing their delivery system. It's not just the large volume of goods. Speed is vital too because perishable goods won't wait. To see just how the computer helps, we'll take a more detailed look at the business of keeping the shelves full. And we'll start in this supermarket with the requirements of the manager, Roy Harrison. One of the requirements we have at Sainsbury's is to maintain an extremely high level of fill. The level of fill being the quantity of goods on the shelves. We've prided ourselves for several years, for many years, with having a very high level of fill. And this is really done by having a 24-hour reordering system. The goods are ordered around lunchtime on a daily basis and sent via GPO modem transmitter overnight to the central computer at Blackfriars. There, they're processed and sent to the varying supplying depots. In our case, it's Basingstoke. And the goods are assembled overnight, and we start receiving them first thing the following morning. The starting point is the order from each shop. Every day, one of the shop assistants walks around the shelves, checking for gaps in the display. She's collecting information for the computer. Every shelf has a label with a barcode, a row of vertical lines. That's a coded description of the commodity. These bars are for 200 gram jars of instant coffee. Running a light pen across those bars reads the coded information, which is then stored inside this special cassette recorder. Reading the barcode once stores an order for one pack of the commodity. To order more packs, the assistant keys in the required quantity. When she's finished, she connects the recorder to a special telephone unit and then forgets all about it. The final destination of that order is here, the Sainsbury's Depot at Basingstoke in Hampshire, some 45 miles away. Late that night, long after the shop has closed, the computer telephones and automatically switches on the cassette recorder to collect the details of the day's order. After which, it sends the order down another telephone line to a printer at the depot. This depot deals with orders from many supermarkets in the south of England, and the printout can run to hundreds of pages. But the depot can't wait for all this printing to be finished. So as soon as a reasonable batch of orders is ready, it's taken off the printer and collated, ready for use in the warehouse. Sainsbury's call these documents debit notes because the goods listed on them are debited against a particular shop. 
These are for the shop at Broadfield, and there's enough stock on this list to fill up five pallets. In a warehouse of this size, there are hundreds of pallets, and orders just can't be dealt with at random. The goods must be picked systematically. So, on the computer printouts, goods are listed in the same order they're stored in the warehouse, and the printout says where they are. Sainsbury's beefy drink is rack P92. And the next item's in rack P96. By the morning, the picking of the order will be complete. The goods will be loaded and dispatched, and they'll arrive at the supermarket ready for the shelves that day. That's one aspect of computerised ordering at Sainsbury's, replenishing the shops. But sending stock to the shops eventually means that the depots get empty. How are they replenished? That's another job for the computer. It knows how fast stock is leaving the depot, so it can print forecasts of how much stock will be needed from each manufacturer on every day in the next week. 60 JS egg custard on Monday the 20th. However, okay. this job's not entirely automatic. 20 JS Bakewell tarts on Tuesday the 21st. Sainsbury's have buyers who assess the demand for each product and who also know about manufacturers' special offers. With their detailed knowledge, they amend the forecasts manually to get the best deal. On Friday the 24th. Fine. Uh, 30 JS Raspberry Trifle on Monday the 20th. And another 30 on Thursday the 23rd. After this, the changes must be put into the computer. For example, 185 will replace 189. Although the keying is fast, entering just the changes saves a lot of time and effort. When the goods arrive at the depot, the computer's ready for them. But there are still manual operations to come of unloading and, most important, checking. The computer may perhaps have ordered 112 cases of macaroni. But have 112 cases arrived? It needs human intervention to check that. The warehouseman gets a receipt note from the computer it lists the goods expected, but doesn't give the quantity. He counts the boxes by hand and writes down the number actually delivered. So if there are discrepancies, they'll be noticed and be dealt with later on. So that's two ways computers are used at Sainsbury. But in this particular store, there's a third way. Just watch this checkout in operation. Instead of keying in prices, the cashier passes all the goods over this small window. That automatically registers what the goods are and their price. Once again, the secret's a barcode. Every single item in the shop has one of these codes on it. The code represents the commodity. Inside the window is a special laser scanner. This reads the code, which is then stored in a small computer. Even in slow motion, it's faster than keying in by hand. The price isn't on the goods, it's stored inside the computer. And for each item, the price is displayed so that the customer can check it, either now or at home, because this system also prints the description of each item on the receipt. 
that's the clearest benefit for the customer. An itemised bill, plus, of course, the extra speed of the checkout. 1824, please. But how do Sainsbury's see the benefit? Can they use the information from those checkouts in any other way? The benefits of scanning come under two categories, from the customer point of view and from the company point of view. The customer gets an itemised receipt and certainly gets quicker service through the checkouts. From the company point of view, we're able to use the information that we get out of the computer on a much quicker basis. At this stage in time, we're certainly using it as a reordering system on selected items, heavy selling things like wines and spirits and cigarettes. The way we plan to use the information from the scanning system in the future is to order the majority of our goods automatically, giving an even better service to our customers. Both the stories in this introductory program were concerned with what the computer does and not with how it does it. Since you don't yet know the jargon and the concepts of computing, we set out to show you some common uses of the computer, together with a few unusual ones, and not to explore them in depth. But from now on, the television programs link directly with your study of individual techniques and concepts, so that you're going to find that they form an integral part of your study of the main concepts in the course. The next programme for this course on computing and computers will introduce three common types of data structures, records, sequences and arrays. You can see this programme in two weeks' time.